I rise to speak on motion 851, standing in my name. And as you all walked in this morning, I hope that you saw the colourful ribbons tied to the fence outside Parliament. I hope when you saw these colourful ribbons, you knew the meaning behind them. As is their intention, I hope you reflected on the impact of child sexual abuse. This is a loud fence, and I believe for the first time it is being displayed at Parliament. Child sexual abuse is a core issue for Darren Hinch's Justice Party. Our party leader went to jail twice for standing up against pedophiles. It was 1986, almost 36 years ago, that Hinch exposed Michael Glennon, a man who had already been jailed for the rape of a young girl who then went on to abuse children within the church. The church covered Glennon's tracks, much like they did for Ridsdale and several other prolific pedophiles, priests. Hinch said in 2012, and I quote, I make no apology for attacking those cover-ups year after year, decade after decade, unquote. Darren wanted to see the offenders jailed for good. Fast forward almost four decades and we're still fighting for the same message, attacking the cover-ups of child sexual abuse. But this time, it's not the church, it's successive state governments in Victoria. A lot of progress has been made over the years, which is great, but there's still some way to go. An apology would be a fitting next step. That brings me to today, where do we begin? When you think of a primary school, I'm sure you picture a playground and kids running around having fun, laughter, your favourite teacher, reading books and so on. And when the survivors of sexual assault at Bow Morris think of their primary school, they see an institution that failed them. They get feelings of guilt, shame and anxiety. The institution that has led their lives down a path of depression, drug and alcohol addiction, crime and other complex mental health challenges. It was not a playground to them, it was hell. Earlier this year, I met a survivor, Glenn, who was abused at Beaumaris Primary. He told me one of the hardest things he's had to grapple with in his journey is that they'd never received an apology for the sex offending that took place at their school. Not just that, but in some cases, convicted pedophiles, and in other cases, offenders who are known to the principal, the teaching staff, and members of the community kept offending. I couldn't believe it was true at first. However, upon investigation, I found out it was entirely true. The Victorian government has never apologised for the atrocities that took place in not just in Bow Morris, but all government schools. Scott Morrison made an apology post-Royal Commission in 2018, and most other states have apologised since then. Tasmania, coincidentally, are currently conducting a commission of inquiry as they realised the Royal Commission was limited in scope. The government and its departments were being flooded with new stories and lawsuits, and so the inquiry began. And I anticipate the Victorian story is the same. That the Royal Commission did not properly investigate abuse in government institutions given its focus on religious bodies. Victoria had a betrayal, betrayal of trust inquiry in 2013 in this place, but it did not look at government organisations. The ACT, Queensland and Victoria are the only states that have never apologised. So what are we asking the state government to apologise for? Well, as I mentioned, the abuse that took place in health facilities, prisons, youth detention, but predominantly schools, was abhorrent. More importantly to the survivors, it was the systemic shuffling of alleged and convicted pedophiles which enabled more children to have their innocence taken away from them. Russell Jackson, a journalist with the ABC, has spoken to over 100 survivors of government sexual abuse from the Bayside area alone. He estimates, conservatively, that there are over 500 survivors in that area. Of the 1,639 applications made to the National Redress Scheme about abuse in government settings, 318 were from government schools. This is in addition to the many private civil claims made. We are potentially talking about thousands of children who have never had their experience recognised by the institution that allowed their abuse to take place. My office has spoken to one of 12 survivors from one perpetrator in the western regions of Hamilton and Ballarat. I'm sure 12 is a conservative number, but it demonstrates that this is so much bigger than any of us could simply imagine. Further, many of those who were abused will never be able to share their story because they're no longer here with us. This is why an apology is so necessary. Offenders who sue the state 
can often get a direct apology as part of their settlement. But what about those who can't afford to sue? What about those who have committed suicide or died young due to the effects of their abuse? Trevor Foster was abused at Beaumars Primary School. He is no longer with us. He went on to have a life impacted by the offending. Trevor's coroner's report couldn't conclude how he was killed, but it was not a very nice way to go. Ian Walker is another one who I've spoken about before, and his sister Karen carries on his legacy and is admirably fighting for change. There are many others who have died in their darkest moments, inevitably due to their abuse. They and their families deserve an apology just as much. At Bo Morris, the offenders, including Gary Mitchell and his brother-in-law, Daryl Ray, Graham Steele, and there are allegations against David McGregor and others. This was a sizable chunk of the teaching staff, so helpless children couldn't escape it. In fact, some of these abusers infiltrated the local Little League clubs to continue their offending. One survivor recounts that the coaches would offer to drop the boys off to their homes after training, and everyone would fight for the back seat. You can only imagine why. They'd get told off by their parents for coming home all muddy, but they couldn't tell their parents the reason they didn't shower at the club rooms. The teachers, in some instances, abused their victims in front of the entire class. There was no discretion. I won't speak to the specifics of their abuse because we have some survivors here with us in the gallery, and I think that it is unnecessarily re-traumatising. I'll just place on the record that the abuse was horrific. Gary Mitchell has been sentenced in 1996, 1999, 2000, 2005 and 2018. I don't think that'll be the last time he sees a courtroom either. More broadly across the education system, these sex offenders include Brian Sword, a principal who worked at many schools, including in Bendigo. In 1999, his victims reported their abuse to police and he then committed suicide. And I think it's safe to say that I hope that he's rotting in hell. Vincent Reynolds was reported against by a parent of a child in 1980. The Department of Education psychiatrist said at the time, and I quote, it is just absolutely stupid sending you back to the classroom because you'll just keep on offending against children, unquote. He went on to teach at a new school in 1981. He then got to teach at four more schools following this. In 92, he was finally charged and convicted for offending against 14 boys, and he received a $16,000 fine. In 2019, he was charged with 42 offences against 38 child complainants aged between just five and 12 years old. He got nine years non-parole, and the victims got a lifetime of pain and trauma. Bob Morris taught at Cranbourne and Ringwood Primary School and across Western Victorian country schools between 1966 and 1980. Several reports were made by parents and in one case we know about to a senior department employee. Morris kept on teaching and he kept on abusing children. Right Side's legals Michael Magazanik said, and I quote, even after police became involved in 1978 and charged Morris, he was acquitted, but he was sent back to teaching and immediately resumed offending. The education department shuffled a pedophile from school to school for years, effectively supplying a child abuser with new victims year after year, unquote. More tragedy could not be spoken. In my region, Gerard Coffey, the brother of the disgraced Brian Desmond Coffey, taught at Boris Street Primary School in Wendaree, Kent Road Primary School, Urquhart Primary School in Ballarat, and apparently also within the education department itself. He was trialled in 1972 and found not guilty. The 12 young female victims were labelled liars and he kept on teaching. One survivor tells me, and I quote, it's sad that we, weren't, we just weren't believed when we were kids. For the education department to shift the pedophiles around was just disgraceful, unquote. And to top off all of this, when whispers were going around the school grounds and to senior, senior staff and principals about the abuse, some teachers were sent to the education department into what was known as the pedophile room. Some were then given references of some sort because they ended up teaching at schools later on. In the case of Daryl Ray, he taught at Tucker Road Primary in Moorabbin in 1967 to 1970, then for five years at Bo Morris Primary School. 
and one year at Mountain View Primary School in Glen Waverley. He was then charged with public indecency in 1978 and was sentenced to three months jail. But he went on to teach at a school for intellectually disabled children at Rossbourne Primary School for close to two decades after. And I can't imagine what happened in all those years. It is just incomprehensible. One prominent child sexual abuse lawyer said to me, and I quote, it's just rampant. There are so many examples of teachers going unheeded by principals. They are every bit as bad as the Catholic Church was in that day, unquote. In true fitting with their deplorable character, some of these sex offenders changed their name or spelling of their name so they'd be untraceable. And just on that note, I did announce today that if we are re-elected in November, I will establish an inquiry into the child abuse, child sex abuse within government institutions, particularly schools. And that is my promise here to survivors and across the state. Something that I still can't comprehend is that after all these men and women have been abused in an institution that was supposed to be keeping them safe, the government is not complying with their own guidelines when dealing with each civil claim. The attorney has told this place that she expects all government departments to comply with the guidelines, but the reality is they're not. They say it's a big accusation to make, and I agree. But it's not coming from us. It's not coming from me. It's coming directly from those who deal with the government on these cases. As an example, I've had numerous lawyers tell me that when they're representing survivors suing the state, the mandatory mediation hearing seven months before trial is taken as a joke. Apparently, the government solicitors come unprepared, not in good faith, without any preparation to negotiate fairly. In the words of Judy Corton, a senior solicitor who specialises in child sexual abuse claims, she quotes, if you're not going to negotiate, why are you here? Unquote. In terms of other non-compliance, they often unnecessarily drag out court proceedings. Many lawyers observe that they do this to either get the survivor to buckle and accept a low offer or withdraw their case. One lawyer stated they'll drag it out until the last minute before a trial. They said, and I quote, the day or week before trial, the government lawyers buckle. They know the true value of the claim. Sometimes the state's not too bad, but other times they fight to the death, unquote. In a call to my office last week, it was made clear by the government that they do not accept that their departments and solicitors have been acting in this way. To that, I say, listen to those working in this space. The rebuttal that breaches may be accidental is an admission that breaches are occurring. And further, it's not just a few lawyers that I've spoken to. It's a consistent story from four separate law firms, and it was published in The Age last year, so it's not new. So what is the effect of the abuse and the arduous court process on the victim? Well, in their words, they don't know how to regulate emotion. Some have resorted to drugs and alcohol. Some push away people they love. Some have thought about suicide regularly since their abuse, and some end up in prison. For example, Rod Owen, a very talented St Kilda footballer, celebrated his 20th anniversary of getting out of prison last Wednesday. This stint was caused by the abuse that he had suffered in a number of institutions, including a government school. Suffice to say, we're all very proud of the corner that Rod has turned and the help that he is providing others. I really do not look forward to hearing the government talk about how they've done enough for historical child sex abuse survivors without committing to the apology today, because actions do speak louder than words, and that is absolutely true. But if you can't apologise, are you really doing all you can for survivors and their recovery? This is about acknowledging what happened at the magnitude to which the state, successive state governments, has failed these children. If the government speak about how there is litigation on foot so they can't comment, well, I'd say that it's, it's double standard. Puffing Billy survivor Justin Drew was suing the state at the time the government made an apology to him and other railway survivors in November 2019. Now, he said, and I quote, the apology means the government is accepting liability, which they didn't years ago. Hopefully we'll get it sorted out and I can get on with my life. It will be a weight off my shoulders, unquote. And they deserve that apology. Today we're talking about hundreds of children in government schools who have never had an apology. And the government's culpability is arguably much higher. And if everyone tries to say that you're just making this issue political, I'd say my office has been trying to work with the Premier's office since May for this apology. And my advisor had three meetings before I said anything in this place and was only made public because we were being stonewalled. We have now had over five meetings and constant contact with their office to try to see how things have been progressing and what we can do to assist. 
but to no commitment. The member for Bentley in the other place has known about this issue since June. Seems we're on, maybe, seems we may be on the nose, despite our best intentions. And this isn't for me, by the way. It's not for Darren Hedges Justice Party. This is for victim survivors of childhood sexual abuse and their families. Nothing more and nothing less. I wish it didn't have to be raised today because I was hoping this day um, would, would be when the apology could take place, but we are here. Being a former socket detective, having interviewed many survivors of all ages, this is something extremely important to me, and I hope the government can do this. There are several people here today in the gallery, upstairs, that I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, Glenn, Lynn, Rick, Marita, Helen and Brian, um, thank you very much for coming here today. Earlier today, um, we had Rod, Tim, Terry, and Judy Corton, of course. And I'm wondering if I hopefully haven't missed anybody out up there, but uh, I really appreciate you coming in today. Incredibly brave, and they represent um, not only themselves as victim survivors, but also as family members and advocates speaking on, on behalf of victim survivors who are no longer with us. So um, your bravery is to be commended, and your advocacy is remarkable, and I thank you. Without your bravery, this abhorrent behaviour would not be known and the offenders would still be among us, continue to perpetuate violence against innocent people. I'd also like to thank Russell Jackson of the ABC, who has done the most incredible investigative journalism on this issue. Your perseverance and friendship to the survivors has been immeasurable. Also, thank you to Shannon Deary and Mark Santo Martino for sharing their stories uh, to bring others forward too. But a special thanks to Glenn for bringing this injustice to my attention. And I'm sure my jaw dropped to the floor when I was told there would be no apology. I can't imagine how this has made you all feel. And I hope you do get one, because frankly, it's the least you deserve. If it doesn't happen, still know that you have been part of the change. And for all of that, you should be bloody proud. And in what could be one of my final speeches in this place, I hope not, of course, but anything can happen. I just want to say that I'm proud of the people and the issues that Darren Hitch's Justice Party has stood for. Ms Maxwell and I have only been here for one term, but I feel like we've achieved a great deal, especially for the victims of crime. And I hope we find ourselves back in this place next term, because there is so much more to do, including on this matter. And on that note, I commend this motion to the House. Thank you, Mr Grimley. <laughs> Minister Lean. Thank you, President. Um, can I, can I first up say, um, and listening to Mr Grimley um, on some of the historic um, horrible events that he outlined in his um, address to us, that, um, and some of the individuals involved, some of the perpetrators, um, I completely agree with him. I'm not a religious person, so I don't believe in heaven and hell, but if I'm wrong, and there is a hell, I hope those people are burning in hell. I, I seriously do hope they are burning in hell. I can't think of a more evil thing that anyone's perpetrated on, on, a, on, a, on a child. It's, it's absolutely appalling. Um, and I, I've been in this house a while and we've had a, a number of debates around similar issues and it's... It's always, it always puts us all back. I think, you know, whether I'm a, a member of the government, whether I'm a minister of government, whether um, I was in opposition, um, any time, um, all of us in here um, are humans, and I think, you know, I, like, I, I think we're all good humans, and we cannot comprehend what young people would have gone through, children. Um, and of course, of course, whether a member of the government or not, and, and, and being a minister of government, of course, we, we feel enormous sorrow for what those people went through. And, not, and I can't, look, I'm not gonna pretend to comprehend it. I'm not gonna pretend to comprehend it. Um, and, and, and I'll try, like, do the best to comprehend what they've had to deal with since then in their adult lives. It's just, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to, as I said, I'm not going to even pretend to be able to comprehend what they've had to deal with um, in their lifetime. Being victims of evil, 
people, they were in a place of trust from their families. It's just appalling. And I think, you know, we, we you know, like opposition and government, you know, we, we don't always acknowledge good work, but um, when um, the Liberal Nationals were in government, I, I, I applaud them for the um, betrayal of trust report, which they, I think it might have been uh, Premier Bale, you champion and led. I, I absolutely applaud them for that. And, and, um, and then I think that was a trigger to a Royal Commission. I, I think that really was. And I think that was a shine of leadership from um, the government of the day. Um, and, and as I said, I can't applaud them enough. I think um, we, uh, I think we may have been to some degree naive at the extent of these horrible criminal acts back then. I think we might have been a bit naive at the extent we didn't really understand how widespread and how many of these evil people were. I think we were naive about what institutions the, you know, these criminals were acting in and it was and how widespread um, that particular was, that particular amount of evil activity was. Um, I think, look, as a government, and I, look, and I, I think, you know, I, I think we didn't know, we always, how is not always known to the extent a series of governments, and I'll give credit to the um, value government at the time, and a series of governments and, and our government, we have, we have grappled and we have, with all good intent, to try to do the right thing by these people. I think, and, and we'll continue to do that with all good intent, um, and, and, and we commit to that. Um, I'm sure um, if Dr Bark's a minister in a couple of months' time, He'll be doing the same thing on behalf of his government. I think that we'll have a, we'll have a, we, we always have tried to have a, well, no, I won't say we have tried. We have had a bipartisan to do, to do the right thing um, by these people whose lives are shattered by evil, evil, the worst type, type of human beings. You can't, can't even comprehend that someone could be that evil. Um, so, um, thank um, Mr Grimley, uh, I thank everyone in this chamber that's constant, like I, I think it's not just Mr Grimley, I think there's been a number of people, I know, I know over the years Mr Finn has um, been very vocal about how evil these people are and, and how they should be treated, I know there's members of the opposition, members of the government, members of the crossbench, many people have been vocal. Um, and I think as a parliament, not just the government, I understand the government of the day has responsibility, but a parliament as well, I think we all just need to... Um, I think these debates are important. We all need to strive together and, and have good intent. Uh, we in no way can take away what happened. We can't... We haven't got time machines. We wish we did. We can't take away what happened, but I think we can all have the best intent um, to acknowledge um, and support um, and do whatever we can um, for people that found themselves victims of um, these evil, evil... Oh, I was going to say human beings. I don't know if they what they are, but evil, evil portrayers um, of such terrible, terrible acts, which I know none of us in here can comprehend. Thank you, Minister Lena. Just before we go, I'd like to acknowledge the president of the, um, the presence, I should say, of the uh, former president, Bob Smith, in the gallery. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Bark. Thank you, Acting President. Um, it's good to follow Minister Lean and Mr Grimley, and I find myself in, in deep agreement with, with both of them. I'd also like to acknowledge 
um, the presence of numerous victim survivors uh, with, us, uh, with us today for this important debate. Um, I wholeheartedly concur with what Mr Lean said. Uh, it's only over the very recent past, actually through processes that Mr Lean spoke about, that we've come to even a superficial understanding of the, the ubiquity of some of the appalling practices, unspeakable practices that are the subject of, of Mr Grimley's motion. Um, and yet I actually think, as a former teacher myself, son of a state school teacher, grandson of a state school principal, that, that there is actually something <laughs> particularly evil about the perpetration of abuse by teachers and other educators. I say that as somebody who is proudly supportive of our teachers and, and educators. Um, and that's because, as teachers and educators, we have access to so much important information about the children in our care. I was teaching two and a half years ago, but before I came into this place, and it was really important for me, really important for me, in seeking to teach my Year 7 English class effectively, for me to have access to a whole series of very personal pieces of information about the girls in my classes, information about their mental health, information about their family status, information about whether they were going through particular gender issues. And so the idea that somebody in that position would use their power over children, their significant power over children, and misuse the information that they had at their fingertips that was supposed to be used to safeguard the well-being of, of young people, first and foremost, is something uniquely horrific. Uh, it's interesting, Mr Grimley talked about Rossbourne School. Well, I went to a state school down the road from Rossbourne School and knew some kids who started off at my, my school and went to, to Rossbourne. Shane Camson, the principal of, of Rossbourne, is, is a mate of mine. I used to work very closely with him. He's a child psychologist. I've been to that school recently. And again, there are vulnerable kids at, at, at that school. Um, my wife's former principal was recently released from prison after having been found guilty of raping a child at, at his school. And so I concur with what Mr Lean said, that I'm afraid the sort of appalling crimes that we're talking about happen far, far too often, certainly historically, happened more often, and then Mr Grimley spoke about the kind of practices that so many institutions engaged in to cover up, shift people around, practices that were designed to protect perpetrators rather than give justice to, to victims. Uh, I appreciate what um, the minister said about the role of the Liberals and Nationals in the Betrayal of Trust report. But, but truth be told, that report was so powerful because of the wonderful engagement of members from all parties, most certainly members from the then Labor opposition, independent members as well. And I remember there were people who said at the time, well, this is the wrong process. Um, that members of parliament shouldn't be the ones to engage in this process. And it was actually a fantastic thing that the work of that report, as harrowing as it was, was carried out in such a, a strongly bipartisan, multi-partisan way. And Mr Lean is right, of course. Most people's analysis is that it was only because of the betrayal of trust report. There was most certainly not a liberal and national achievement. That was an achievement of Victorian parliament and something that was advocated for by so many victims and survivors then led to the Royal Commission. I, I take Mr Grimley's point and I agree with his point that of course there's been a particular focus in these discussions on abuse in religious institutions and that abuse is appalling. Uh, we, we know that, I'm afraid, historically, please God, let's hope it doesn't still happen, certainly not to the extent that it did, but we do know that historically there were dreadful processes, criminal processes, in state institutions and state schools that, that facilitated, actively facilitated the ongoing abuse of so many children. And I agree with Mr Grimley 
that there hasn't been the sort of focus on abuse in these settings that there has been in, in other settings. And so I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak on this important motion. Uh, it has a huge amount to commend itself. I think Mr Grimley, after listening, as I know he has done, to so many victims and survivors, uh, is most genuine in, in his desire to see better outcomes. We can do that, working together, and, and like other members, I sincerely hope that I'm here with Mr Grimley and other members of this place post-November to continue that work together. Thank you, Dr Bark. Ms Taylor. Um, so yes, uh, so um, thank you to Mr Grimley for bringing forward uh, this um, motion, um, obvious, and also thank you to members of the gallery who are here with us today. That is incredibly brave, to say the least. Um, and um, I know that I think uh, very much everyone here is determined for this to be very much a collaborative and bipartisan space as it, as it really needs to be, and that's the only way that uh, the best possible outcomes uh, can be um, achieved in this space. Uh, and I concur with all who have spoken here today that it's actually excruciating to even contemplate um, the sheer betrayal of trust because... Um, you know, every child, every student should have the right to be able to turn up to school each day and expect and expect that those in charge will respect them in return and honour their boundaries and their right to be able to learn free from any kind of untoward interference whatsoever. And so to have that trust, um, for want of a better word, and I don't want to be presuming how different people would respond or feel, but for, for want of a better word, obliterated, I think might be, hopefully go some way um, to encapsulate what that might be like. And I'm not here to presume what it's like, only those who have been through that um, would know authentically what that space is like. And um, I, I didn't have a long career like you have, um, Dr. Bark, in, in teaching. I did teach for a, uh, a brief period of time and I can recall, and this debate is not about me and my teaching, I'm getting to the point, but my goal each day was to make sure that I kept the class calm, that, we, they, that students had interesting work and that they actually learned something and hopefully that they were happy um, and that they got something out of that hour or whatever that I had with them, and to imagine any other outcome other than that is horrifying to me as someone who did have that position of trust when um, I was a teacher. And uh, as I say, it was only a, a year or so in my life, but, um, yeah, to contemplate that uh, anyone could abuse the privilege of having that kind of um, auspice over a room of very of, of young and vulnerable uh, children um, is absolutely horrifying, and um, and you know I can only imagine, and I say I have to imagine. I'm not here to presume how uh, different people would experience that kind of betrayal and that kind of you know. Abuse, it's abuse, obviously. Um, how one gets over that? How do you recover from that kind of um, extraordinarily um, painful? And I would say also it, it must be incredibly confusing because, as you say, you should be able to go to school or, or the relevant um, sort of uh, learning institution um, with hope and with joy and with aspiration for, a, you know, a, a positive future, and to have that space um, completely, uh, for want of a better word, destroyed. I think it is destroyed. The, the, the space that should, of, of trust 
and 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 having and faith that that you will give your best that you can do on each day and have that return and respected by the member of authority that is the teacher or otherwise in front of you um, you know that that should be a minimum that you should expect from that experience and so um, you know learning about you know the horrifying things that have that that have taken place, that absolutely have taken place, and were never, ever the fault of those who have experienced the abuse. Never. Um, and there is no excuse for it. There is no excuse for it. And um, so I, I hope, uh, you know, certainly uh, having this debate today, um, one of the uh, elements that may be born out of it is also um, enhancing the awareness and understanding of what uh, you know victims or victim survivors of abuse have been through. Um, obviously, there are many, many other elements, um, very complex elements to this debate that are warranted, and this is the right. You know, this is one of the uh, many uh, spaces where such things can be discussed in a very respectful way. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is horrifying to think the extent and the prevalence of it as well. Um, and I know even from, which is not actually relevant to this discussion here, but even having friends and relatives who were victims of abuse that, um, yeah, the prevalence is, is, is it's pretty shocking, and I, I'm not telling people, anyone in this chamber who isn't aware of that, but I'm just reflecting here as we have this debate. Um, it is mortifying to think that there are those who um, have severely crossed and betrayed the trust of, um, you know, vulnerable young people in our state, um, and certainly um, it has to be, and it is a, a priority to obviously make, make sure that does not ever happen again. And that is another, I would say, relevant element to this debate is also the preventative elements um, of protecting children into the future. But also, obviously, it's critical to be very upfront and frank about what has happened. And I don't think anyone here is resiling from uh, what has happened and, uh, and making sure that those who have been through um, such horrors are absolutely believed um, because uh, nothing worse than not having um, those kind of traumatic experiences uh, believed as such um, uh, because that is absolutely, well, I would have thought is absolutely vital. Um, and the final point I was going to say, and it was further to a point that um, Minister Lean says, is that, I mean, I think as parliamentarians we come to the chamber with, I think we would seek to come to the chamber with good intent every day, with every debate, um, but I think a debate of this nature really uh, brings out that very human element and that most vulnerable element um, that I would like to think we are relating to in this, um, you know, very sensitive moment that we are having um, with this discussion in the chamber uh, right now. So um, again, I, uh, I will thank all the uh, victim survivors for uh, coming here today. Um, that's incredibly courageous, um, but uh, I think it it's it, it's certainly very much appreciated and uh, I just would like to say that authentically and I, th I think speaking for everyone here in the parliament although it's probably best that people speak for themselves that uh, this discussion is absolutely approached in earnest um, with sensitivity and compassion for the extraordinary pain that so many uh, victim survivors have been through that they should never have had to go through and uh, and that is extraordinarily unfair um, to say the least so um, I think I might leave my discussion there thank you 
Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Mr. Barton. Thank you, um, <coughs> excuse me, Acting President. I rise to speak on the motion brought to this House by uh, Mr. Grimley. This is very sad, this subject. And I want to thank you for coming here today and sharing. An apology to those who have suffered abuse in government schools is appropriate and it's needed. We know how important an apology can be in acknowledging the unfair pain and suffering experienced by victims and their families. It's not always closure, but it goes a long way in making victims feel heard and understood and loved. A public apology allows us to all agree that what occurred was unacceptable. And we must always work to make sure that this doesn't happen again. There is a precedent for Victorian government apologies, and I can see no reason as to why this apology can't be done. On the matter of governments and departments acting as a model litigant, I have some experience in this. I have stood in this House multiple times and reminded ministers and the Attorney General of their obligations to ensure departments are acting as a model litigant. Clearly, this has fallen on deaf ears. As the courts have firmly held since 1912, it is an expectation that the state and its agencies will act as a model litigant. That is, that is that they will act with propriety, fairly and to the highest professional standards. In particular, the model litigant guidelines also include the state and its agencies to keep litigation costs to a minimum and to deal with claims properly so not to cause any unnecessary delay. In my experience, when I, was, when I consider the commercial passenger vehicle, Victoria and the Department of Transport, they have failed to meet all these obligations. After four years in court, taxi and hire car families, some of the poorest people, in the Supreme Court received a ruling for the commercial passenger vehicles Victoria to hand over the requested documents and pay 80% of families' legal fees. One year later, taxi families were forced to renegotiate again. It's obvious that the regular was trying to run these families out of money. There is no doubt. Not only is the CPV trying to cripple families who have already faced discriminatory regulations and reforms in the CPV, but this agency also questionably behaviour in other court battles. I'm told the regulator employs over 20 lawyers within their department, yet they have gone outside their organisation to spend big, so big bucks on the government's preferred secret keeper, Mick, Mick Batskos. This is after the Victoria Privacy Commission ruled in my favour that the documents requested in the Freedom of Information request should be handed over for, the, for a trial in Geelong. Taxpayer money is being used by the ER regulator to merely to hide the outcomes of a six-person trial that ran for eight weeks in 2020. With such money involved to fight the Privacy Commission's ruling, we all wonder what the regulator was hiding at this trial. After multiple hearings at VCAT, we have resolved the matter and most documents uh, were released. Imagine how many taxpayer dollars would have been saved if they just handed over the information over as they are required to do in the beginning. This causes enormous stress to those families having to go through this. This is not transparency. This is not accountability. This is not the actions of a model litigant. Only yesterday, I saw the Age 
a report on secretive nature of the Victorian government's departments. The Victorian Information Commissioner revealed that more FOI requests were lodged in Victoria than any other jurisdiction in Australia, including the Commonwealth. This is unbelievable. Clearly, this government and the bureaucracy have a lot they don't want released. In 2021 alone, over 42,000 FOI requests were lodged in Victoria. This was a new record, and it is expected we will exceed that record again. It comes down to this getting of information. So who is responsible for ensuring departments behave as model litigants? I thank Mr Grimley for bringing attention to this issue. It's a very important issue. We need a commitment from whoever is to hold government come November 26, that these departments will meet their obligation to behave as model litigants and operate transparently and with integrity. Certainly, much needs to be done to bring their bureaucracy into line with community expectations. I will commend this Bill of the House. Thank you, Mr Barton. Mr McIntosh. Thank you, Acting President. <coughs> I'd like to start off by acknowledging um, everyone here with us today. Uh, this is um, not as personal for me as, as what it is, obviously, for some. But uh, I grew up in Ballarat, so uh, uh, all I can say is that my life has been, well, our community, maybe not my life, well, it is my life, our community has been. Um, just changed by the events that occurred over many, many decades. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just start off by saying that um, I, I've recently joined the parliament and in my first speech I spoke about um, you know, the loss of a lot of mates. I've lost far too many mates for my age, um, but also co-workers and um, and one of those co-workers, I won't mention by name, but um, I was a sparky, I worked on construction sites and there's some pretty tough guys on there and, and this guy had a big business and a lot of money and ran a lot of blokes and had a nickname that was very bravado and um, tragically he took his life and it only came out uh, later what, what he'd been through when he was young and, um, and at the time we didn't have any idea. I, I've had probably more exposure to the stories that what's gone on, particularly in the church, than many as I've had um, family who've been in the priesthood and have fought a battle for a very, very long time, um, for decades, and the cover-ups went on for decades. Um, and we know that now, and, um, you know, I, I don't cry very often in my life, but watching the movie spotlight a few years ago it uh, really got to me at the end of the movie in the cinema and um, yeah I just you know I, I think there's a number of things I want to talk about on this but uh, perhaps I'll start with how much admiration I have for survivors um, and it's, it's sort of interesting over I'm just not, maybe not interesting is not the right word but over time you become aware of more individuals and more families and um, and I, all I can say is the courage or the, maybe not courage but the the resolve for people who are for survivors who are still with us I'm so thankful they are because um, of that other you know seven or six seven mates I've lost I've got my suspicions about why they're not with us, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but I wish that, uh, you know, I, I wish that they'd have either had the support or the, um, the capacity to be as incredible as those that are still with us are. Um, so I'll start off by just paying absolute respect to survivors. Um, to those that have perpetrated, I'm, I'm even, I'm less, I try and disconnect myself 
from them as opposed to those that have covered up and enabled them for so many years. Just like I'm a lot less angry now than what I used to be. I used to be very, very angry. Um, and I'm just glad that um, steps have been taken over the last decade to you know, expose, and I'm talking very much from a Ballarat perspective and of the church here, some of those who did so much wrong. Um, because the way heels were dug in from the, the knowledge I have, which is my understanding, which I believe to be correct, the, the way, and as we've heard so many reports of, the way heels were dug in for so many decades, the increased trauma that put into our communities is just boggles my mind. If we're here and we believe in equality and equal opportunity, um, opportunity and access to equality in communities for somewhere like Ballarat, which has just had entire layers of damage put in and then the subsequential drug abuse, alcohol abuse, which is completely understandable, um, that's, that additionally makes my blood boil, that so much trauma has been inflicted, generational trauma has been inflicted on a community by people who were supposed to be doing exactly the opposite. Um, so many people expected the best uh, and the best of, the ch of churches and religion and churches is very good. But the worst, as we've seen, is, has been atrocious. And that's not only destroyed communities broadly with the trauma in there, but it's also taken a lot away a lot of people's faith and a lot of people's communities of faith, which um, not only, like that's, again, we're just talking about these flow on effects. So I, I'm very mindful not to talk about flow on effects because those directly impacted, they're the, they're the people that we need to be directly mindful of. Um, so, yeah, it's, for, for me, I just hope that we never um, again see, like, we don't want, anything like this inflicted on anyone, let alone at this sort of scale and level. And I hope that um, we, we never see it again and the lessons, the lessons are learned that we cannot ignore um, things like this that have, that have gone on and have occurred. Um, and I think, By doing so, it's just inflicted so much more pain that, uh, A, suffering, but B, pain that, that never should have occurred. So, um, yeah, it's very difficult to find any words that are adequate, but, yeah, I just want to want to say again how much respect I have and, um, and yeah, I wish, wish everyone all the best. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. Mr. Finn. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting President. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, commend Mr. Grimley uh, for bringing this matter um, to uh, to the House today. It's uh, I'd suggest uh, long overdue for this matter to be addressed. Uh, secondly, I'd like to um, commend those brave individuals uh, who are in the gallery today. Um, and commend them on their efforts. Um, they want what I want, and that is justice. Uh, and this parliament's supposed to be about justice. If we're not about justice, then nobody's about justice. And uh, this motion will bring a degree, a degree, I don't say all, but a degree of satisfaction with regard to justice uh, on this, uh, in this particular matter. And I hope that that justice um, is delivered soon, very soon.
because it is long, uh, long overdue. Um, I remember um, some years ago in the midst of uh, the appalling revelations uh, of um, abuse in religious schools, um, a police officer said to me, uh, yes, this is bad, but wait until you see what's happened in the government sector. Now, he wasn't just talking about schools. He was talking about uh, um, social services. He's talking about a whole range of, um, uh, of government uh, institutions where, uh, where child abuse, um, in his view, was rife um, and had been rife for, for many, many years. You've got to realise that schools and, well, basically anywhere where children gather, they, they, um, they're like, they're like a, a light on a hot night. They, they attract pedophiles uh, like mosquitoes. And as much as I would like to, um, to, uh, to whack the pedophiles like I whack the mosquitoes, um, we have to find a way to stop them from abusing these kids. We have to find a way of, uh, of, of um, uh, exposing these, these creatures um, for what they are. And, 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 and we have to find a way to stop them from getting near the kids. We, we have to find a way of protecting those children. We cannot, we cannot allow um, these, these oh, if I could use the word that I wanted to use, I'd probably be thrown out, but the, the, these creatures, if we could find a way to, um, to siphon these creatures, well, then I think we would, uh, we would go a long way um, towards protecting these kids. I spend um, a great deal of my life and have been for a long time um, fighting for children, for, for, uh, for tiny children, but children nonetheless. Uh, and I am appalled uh, by what I have discovered uh, over, over recent years, and as I've said uh, in this house um, uh, often enough, uh, I'm ashamed of myself that I didn't actually believe it um, to begin with. Um, I thought it too, ho too, too horrific. I thought it uh, too far-fetched uh, to be true. But unfortunately, um, what we have seen uh, come out over probably the last uh, 20 years uh, is is so much, it's too much evidence, too much evidence to uh, uh, to um, deny, and and I, I fear I fear what's coming, because I think once we start investigating what has gone on in um, government institutions, uh, we're going to see um, an enormous uh, an enormous amount more uh, of of some pretty hor hor horrific horrific uh, activity, um, the, the the pain, the suffering. Um, of, of children, um, of their parents, of their siblings, uh, and the flow-on effect, as, as Mr McDonald spoke of a minute ago, uh, through, through their families, through their friends. And, you know, I, I've, I've raised, um, well, I've spoken of in the past, uh, a good mate of mine at school, uh, who um, about, about a year after we finished up, um, uh, he shot himself. Now... He and I um, had been uh, together at, um, at Rupertswood in Sunbury at school, um, both boarders, uh, and um, I, had, I had no idea what was going on. They left me right alone, which is uh, a good thing in my view. Um, but there were others who were abused uh, horrifically. Uh, and some of the teachers that I had at school, priests if you don't mind, uh, are still in jail. Uh, may they rot in jail, and once they have finished in jail, may they rot in hell. That's my view. You know, some some of these some of these priests, um, they, were, they were great actors. They were great actors. They should have been in Hollywood. Uh, the, the 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 front that they put up, um, but at the same time, they were they were committing some of the most evil acts imaginable. Yeah, they 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 teach you. Um, about the faith one day, and then that night they'd be abusing the kids. Just unbelievable, unbelievable. It took me a very, very long time um, to, um, 
to come to grips with that, I have to say, and I'm not sure uh, that I have, I have yet. I'm not sure that I have completely uh, done that yet. But, um, you know, the fact that I, I had friends, I had um, schoolmates uh, who were being abused at the same time as I was living with them. You know, we were, we were, we were sleeping in the same dormitory together. You know, we, we were, we were um, um, as, as close, as, close as, as you could possibly be um, to other human beings. They were being abused and nobody knew about it. Nobody could, uh, nobody could protect them um, and, and nobody could, um, could uh, stop what we didn't actually know was happening. So it was, it was, it was extraordinary, an extraordinarily dreadful um, experience, uh, dreadful feeling. When I found out what was going on, um, I, felt, I felt a sense of guilt, in fact, that I hadn't known, that, that I hadn't known and, and wasn't able to do anything to stop it. And uh, that, that, uh, that guilt, I have to say, still uh, lingers with me. Um, it, it might be um, uh, misguided, I don't know, but, but it, it is there uh, nonetheless. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this motion has passed today. I believe um, the, the victim survivors uh, those here today and those uh, outside um, of, this, uh, of this building. Um, they deserve an apology from the state. Uh, now, I can understand that the state would not want to um, uh, declare liability uh, because uh, they, they um, would, would probably find themselves in court. But the fact is they are liable. You know, this, this happened, this happened uh, in government institutions. You know, the, the, the governments, governments control these places. Governments employed the people who uh, committed, and I use the term people very, very, very loosely, uh, the, 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 the creatures who, uh, who committed these crimes. Governments um, employed them, paid them. Uh, it, it, is, it is government responsibility. And, you know, I, one of the reasons I, I came into Parliament was to make government responsible for what it did on a whole range of fronts. And this is most surely uh, one... Uh, where they should. And the first thing, the first thing that they should do, that the government should do, and, and whether it be um, the Andrews government, the Guy government, uh, or any other government uh, after, after November the 26th, what, whichever government it is, um, the, one of the first things they should do in the next term uh, is to apologise uh, on behalf of the government to the victims of this abuse. Uh, I, I think uh, that is... Um, uh, it's, so, it's just so important that, that for, for the, mental, the mental health of those who've been abused, to know that they, that they at least have a government which accepts that they're telling the truth and they have been telling the truth. Because a lot of, a lot of kids, whether it be in government uh, institutions or, or, or schools or, or, or religious schools, you know, they were told for years, don't be stupid. Of course that didn't happen. Well, it did. It did. And, you know, it's really important that they be told that we as a society, we as a community, accept that they were not lying, that they were telling the truth. And we put, figuratively, uh, an arm around them and, and hold them and let them know that we are on their side. The government should apologise. Um, I rise to give my thoughts on um, Mr Grimley's motion. Obviously, I support it. Um, my experience with dealing with pedophiles was that I, um, I struggled to treat them as people. And Mr Grimley will know what I'm talking about. We, we were doing the same thing for a while. Um, and I, I really don't know. There was CPS back when I did it, but um, I don't know how you did it in the socket, Mr Grimley. I couldn't have done it without getting myself, getting myself in jail. Um, very early on, I learned these people might look like people. They might look human. They might act human sometimes. Um, but they weren't. Um, I, I, I've stepped in things that have... Um, I've been better than them. 
and yet they all thought that they had done nothing wrong. And that was the thing I struggled with most. But um, fortunately, I managed to get through my time without doing anything to them that they deserved. Um, whilst I'm not religious in any way, I'm a bit Old Testament in what I think punishment should be. And I think um, our legal system has a lot to answer for, particularly in the sentencing. Finding people guilty is one thing. Putting them away forever, which is what most of them deserve, or more, is another. And nothing makes my blood boil than watching someone's sentence get reduced um, for doing something like this. There was a recent one where someone assaulted, I think, an eight-week-old baby, and they ended up with their sentence reduced for some reason. As the father of a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter in my later years, um, I'll give fair notice anyone touches her, they won't have to worry about the legal system. Um, but getting back to the business, I, uh, funnily enough, this year some news came out about the, um, well, that I finally found out about, about the Beaumaris Primary School in the 80s. Um, as it turns out, I ended up in Beaumaris High School in the early 80s by moving to Melbourne. So um, Beaumaris is a, a suburb that is affluent, leafy. It's a very good suburb, Mr Davis. Um, unfortunately, school, uh, the primary school also had, um, had pedophiles there. And I was in the high school, to be fair, but I, I knew nothing about it. My world was fine. And whilst I was never um, interfered with in any way, um, people very close to me were. And um, maybe, that, uh, maybe that influenced my thought later on in my, my various careers. But the cover-ups are what bothers me. And it's not cover-ups when someone's complicit in the, in the, um, the act, the crime. It's cover-ups when it's to hide embarrassment, whether it's institutional or personal. That is, that is probably the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. And it's, um, it's not just going to the religious things where people, were, priests were moved around to try and just um, keep them out of um, uh, the eye of the, of the public. I'm sure the, um, that happened with some of the, the pedophile school teachers too. But what on earth goes through anyone's mind where someone's done something like that and they try and cover it up? Um, Despite having parliamentary privilege, I still have to watch my mouth in this place because um, I have to retract some of the things I would say. Um, but I'm going to go to Mr Grimley's motion and there's a lot of stuff in there that's been said a thousand times. But let's get down to the National Regress Scheme. 1,639 applications, 318 have, been successfully, um, have successfully claimed redress. Now, that's not counting the people that sued. Being a model litigant is actually should be critical to a government. Um, there are other instances where I know there have been model litigants, and um, to be frank, it's got nothing to do with this sort of thing, but it annoys me. But if they can be model litigants in um, winning cases against um, interest groups, then they can be model litigants against, or for, I should say, not against, but for people that have suffered personal attacks in government institutions. They can do the right thing. It's not that hard. Um, I was listening to Mr Barton talking about his things with the taxi industry. It's clearly not just aimed, unfortunately, it's not just aimed at these people. It's a problem that the government, and I'm not pointing, in fact, I'm pointing at both sides, really, opposition and government, because sometimes they will be both. It's something they need to do. They need to keep an eye on. When a government is formed, the government takes responsibility for the people. It governs for the people, and it provides services. And like any service provider, you have a degree of responsibility. And that responsibility also is that you can go to school and not get attacked by a pervert. Um, and when these things happen, and we find out down the line, then it's the government's responsibility to deal with that properly, to deal with that expeditiously, and to deal with that fairly. No amount of money will make up for the harm people received. And I'm deliberately not looking at the people behind me because I struggle with these things. Um, the, their strength, I think, is monumental. But um, I get so angry at how these people were attacked for doing nothing. That these people were attacked and in a government institution and now struggling to get some form of redress. So 
I don't know, obviously I'm supporting this motion, but I would like to think that an apology will be given. We've apologised for all sorts of things in this place, and if being attacked by a pervert in a government institution is not worthy of an apology, then what is? Really, what is? It needs to be done. It's only fair. And also, I think the... Um, the... Just basically, the, the government needs to comply with its own guidelines and let these people repair themselves as best they can and get further away from the hell that was supposed to be their childhood. Thank you. And